Thank you, Guy. Uh, let me try to start my screen share. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yep, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation and for taking all the trouble to organize uh, this wonderful workshop online. So I'm going to talk about some uh, properties of uh, boosting algorithms in high dimensions. And this is based on joint work with Tengwen Liang, who is an assistant professor, uh, professor currently at UChicago. So boosting is an ensemble learning algorithm, which is pretty old. Its roots trace back to the works of Valiant uh, uh, around the theory of learnability. Uh, so what the boosting algorithm does is uh, it's a way, it's an iterative algorithm uh, and an ensemble learning algorithm. And in each iterate, it calls a bunch of weak learners and then it combines the predictions you receive from the weak learners in a smart way. And the earliest and most popular version of boosting was Adaboost due to Freund and Shapire, where you have a bunch of training examples. Uh, that's your training data. So you start with a uniform weight on your training data. And at each iterate, uh, you upway or downway your training examples uh, based on an exponential uh, loss function, uh, exponential weighing mechanism. And the important feature of Adaboost is that uh, this weight parameter here, alpha t, is going to be chosen adaptively based on the error you anchor at time t. And it so turned out that moving away from earlier versions of boosting to an adaptive weighing scheme suddenly yielded an algorithm which has extremely good generalization performance. Okay, so uh, Adaboost was observed to perform extremely well in practice, and this is uh, sort of a picture that was observed in multiple works in around 96 and 98. Now, what you see here um, is that uh, this is iteration, and we're plotting the training error of Adaboost, and you can see it goes to zero. Uh, this is around iteration five. But now the generalization error is here, and you will see that this just keeps on decreasing. There is no double descent or multiple descent here. And this sort of uh, ties to uh, DS Coley's talk uh, earlier. I think you know, this, this is because this is an ensemble learning algorithm. So somehow automatically the way weights are, weights are combined leads to this kind of a generalization error curve. Now this phenomenon of interpolating the training data is now, now very common and we understand many aspects about it very well. But uh, when this was er earlier observed for boosting and bagging, this naturally uh, picked the interest of a broad community of uh, machine learning researchers and statisticians. So one of the explanations that was put forth uh, uh, in those days was that uh, the key quantity that explains this picture is the empirical margin distribution. Okay, so what is the mar empirical margin? So given any training example and a classifier F, the margin of that example is defined to be this product. And in this paper, Shapir et al., uh, the, the thing we observed is the following. So on, on the plot on the right, um, I'm plotting the fraction of examples for which uh, the margin is below some threshold uh, for, t, uh, for three time iterations. So this curve is for t equals five, this one is for t equals 100, and the solid one is for t equals 1,000. So when you run Adaboost, you will see that initially the margin distribution you know, has some structure, but along the path of iteration numbers, uh, what happens is that the fraction of examples with a large margin increases. So by the time you're at t equals 100, there is almost no point with margin below 0.5. And the margin distribution furthermore stabilizes to some, uh, some, emperor, some, some cumulative distribution function. Okay, so this, this quantity was put forth as a very key quantity. And in fact, what they had shown uh, was generalization error bounds. So if you take any classifier of this form and if you, if you scale by the L1 norm, then the generalization error can be upper bounded by uh, in this way. And the first term here is your empirical margin distribution. Kappa can be any threshold that you would like to pick. And the second term, is uh, you know the generalization error you incur for a certain threshold, and this term is independent of kappa. So the natural thing to do, looking at this bound, would be so if you want to obtain the best possible upper bound that you could, you can fix theta, and in that case, you can choose kappa to be 
you know, just minimum of these objects. So this first term will be zero. Uh, and then if you wanted to optimize over all classifiers of this form, you would choose kappa to be this max min L1 margin. So this quantity is known as the max min L1 margin. If you do that, you immediately get an upper bound for the generalization error of this form. So it's one over square root 10 times this object. Okay, uh, but, and this upper bound has subsequently been improved, but still in the literature, this connection between generalization and the error and the max mean margin is known through upper bounds. But it so turned out that, that this max min L1 margin is not just important for generalization. If you wanted to study how many steps add a boost is going to take before it reaches zero training error or, or perfectly, you know, into starts interpolating the training data, one can also provide upper bounds to this quantity. And once again, the max min L1 margin shows up here. So this, this bounds are due to Zhang and Yu around 2005. But we don't really know whether this upper bound is tight. Okay. Um, and then if we follow the literature, uh, this max min L1 margin comes back to the picture again. Uh, if you want to understand the path of add a boost. So imagine that your data is linearly separable, uh, th that we're in a classification setting where uh, the outcome or response, uh, if you will, is a plus minus one. Then we say that the data is linearly separable if there is a hyperplane that perfectly separates the two groups. And then you can define the min L1 norm interpolated classifier to be, if you look at all, all possible vectors that separates uh, your data, then the one with the minimum L1 norm. And for boosting, it is well known that uh, if you take the step size in the algorithm, uh, the adaptive step size, uh, to be infinitesimal in the sense that this, if you send the, send the step size off to zero, and if you send the time iterates off to infinity, then this scaled iterates from boosting where they're scaled by the L1 norm, this actually converges to this min L1 norm interpolant. So uh, what this kind of suggests is that in this special limit, boosting converges to this quantity, uh, but this also gives other insights uh, in the sense that from these works, you can also read off that boosting in some sense follows, the path follows uh, that of an L1 regularized empirical risk minimization problem. And this min L1 norm interpolant is actually directly connected to the max L1 margin because uh, in this optimization here, whichever theta uh, achieves the optimal value, that's actually given by the min L1 norm interpolant. Okay, so these results seem to suggest that, okay, both this interpolant and the margin are key players in boosting. Uh, but in the past, uh, we only knew sort of upper bounds uh, for the, these two properties of the algorithm uh, based on this object. So in this talk, we are going to try to provide certain precise characterizations of these, uh, these quantities. So we're going to ask, okay, exactly how large is this L1 margin going to be? And if we look at the min L1 norm interpolant, uh, what are the properties of uh, that particular estimator? And then we will switch gears and come back to boosting and try to study precisely, okay, how long does boosting take to reach this min, L min norm interpolant? And that will give rise to a precise characterization of the generalization error of the algorithm. And we'll be able to study certain other properties of this as well. And we'll do all of this in the high dimensional scaling limits that uh, have featured in the earlier talks today. And here I just want to mention that boosting is, a, is an ensemble learning algorithm and there are many other ensemble learning algorithms uh, like random forest bagging, uh, but it's hard to study ensemble learners in general. But for boosting, it so turns out that through this connection with the min norm interpolant, you can study precise properties of these algorithms. And my hope is that uh, you know, some of the proof techniques can be used to study on other ensemble learners, uh, or you know, like even when you combine, uh, you know, some of the techniques have also been used for like in the context of neural networks uh, and where, when they are being ensemble. Okay, so the inspiration for our work is uh, tied to sort of very, uh, both historical and recent literature in, in statistical physics and in other areas. So our proof techniques are gonna be based on Gaussian comparison uh, results uh, that date back to Gordon in 88, and then more recently, what is known as convex Gaussian minimax theorem, which was, uh, which was proved in the context of high dimensional M estimation. 
Now, I want to mention that max L2 margin is a very well studied problem. So in the case of isotropic uh, design matrices where there is no, there's independence between the response and the covariates, uh, the predictions for what happens to the max L2 margin limit are due to Gardner in 88, and these were subsequently rigorized by Sherbina and Tirozzi in uh, 2003. But more recently, uh, this, this paper due to Montanari et al. and Deng et al. studied these objects under more general covariance matrices and characterized their precise limits. Uh, so what's different between L1 and L2, it's just L1 and L2 geometries are significantly different, and the L1 case lacks certain important strong convexity type features that L2 has. So to rigorize the proofs that calls for certain novel techniques and uh, new uniform convergence arguments, but I'll probably not have time to go over those today. And of course, as you can imagine, when things, you know, things will be characterized through fixed point equations here, uh, as well as in the L2 case, and we will obtain uh, different fixed point equations for the L1. Okay, so now diving into, into the formal setting. Um, Okay, uh, so I'm going to be under the usual high dimensional scaling limit where P by N goes to a constant and this will be the model uh, plus minus, uh, you know, the labels are plus minus one given some covariates. So let's skip over this condition on the signal strength. Uh, so we have three problem parameters, but we'll also be in the linearly separable regime asymptotically, which basically means that this over parameterized ratio is above a certain threshold, which is a function of uh, the signal strength parameter. So what are the results we have? We have a very precise characterization of this uh, maximum L1 uh, margin. Uh, in the limit, it can be related to you know, uh, a particular function, which is a function of the problem parameters, and this function can be explicitly pinned down. Uh, this function is also related to the uh, MLE existence phase transition curve for logistic regression, but uh, I'm just gonna leave that as a comment. Now we are looking at infimum over all kappa non-negative and that this function is non-negative over that set. And this function, we can prove that it is continuous and non-decreasing. So things are uh, well-defined. Um, we have a very precise characterization of what this function should be, but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, the characterization itself short, sort of shows that what are the connections with uh, certain earlier results uh, in the context of uh, um, you know, separability of the data uh, when you have logistic model or when you have a general F here. Okay, uh, and then regarding the min L1 norm interpolant, what we are able to show is, you know, one can characterize, so this will be the generalization error of that estimator, and we can characterize the precise limit of this object. Uh, YZ1, Z2 are random variables uh, which have a specific description. But what are these constants? These constants together with another constant S star is gonna be a unique solution to a nonlinear system of equations. Uh, the equation is parameterized by your dimensionality, uh, the ratio P over N, and uh, also the limit of your maximum L1 margin. And these constants are, you know, they have certain interpretations. So C1 star is gonna be the angle between the interpolant and the planted direction. C2 star is the norm of the residuals of this quantity and S star can be used as Lagrange multipliers. And we can also show certain other properties of this min L1 norm interpolant, uh, you know, which, which can all be described through these constants. Uh, and now coming back to boosting, what does uh, all of this tell us? In the past, we knew uh, these results about the number of optimization state, uh, steps and the boosting uh, path. Uh, now what we're able to show is the following. So we can choose an appropriate step size sequence such that uh, for any epsilon, uh, if uh, we have uh, the iteration time is above a certain threshold, then the boosting solution approximates the min L1 interpolated classifier uh, up to error uh, epsilon. And that can be characterized precisely through this form. So kappa star is the limit that we obtain for the max min L1 margin. And this threshold has a precise characterization when uh, the N and P are both diverging in the particular high dimensional limit that I mentioned, okay? And the max min L1 margin limit shows up here as well. So if we contrast with classical results, the classical upper bound was this. And if we, you know, just plug in the limit instead of the empirical version, then this is the upper bound. Uh, the Y axis is uh, the ratio P over N. And uh, for us, the, the 
the precise limit that we characterize is over here. Uh, the separability threshold is over here. So you can see that there is some gap uh, and this into asymptote as uh, the psi is increasing. And then again, revisiting this result, this also characterizes the stopping time precisely. And if we uh, plot this denominator as a function of psi, then we see that this object increases as psi increases. Uh, so that says that uh, when the, you know, the effective dimensionality increases, then uh, over parameterization increases, then the optimization is faster and you converge to this uh, min L1 norm interval and uh, direction faster. And as an aside, we can study some other structural properties of boosting as well. For instance, if you were interested to understand, okay, when, when boosting reaches, you know, zero training error, what does the boosting uh, classifier look like? You know, because it goes to an L1 direction soon after that. So, you know, it, it is expected to have some degree of sparsity. And so we can characterize that if, you know, we look at the fraction of uh, non-zero coordinates in the boosting solution at a certain time, you know, when it first hits the zero training error, we can characterize an upper bound on this object that once again, it's related to this maximum L1 margin. And this upper bound shows that actually, you know, the solution is gonna be quite sparse. And this is, you know, sort of the tightest upper bound we know uh, that exists in the literature. Okay, so, uh, Maybe I'll start wrapping up. Uh, basically in this work, what we try to do is provide precise characterizations of the maximum L1 margin of the male L1 norm interpolant. And because of this subtle connection with boosting that under, lets, helps us understand this algorithm much better than before. So we can improve the existing bounds and provide precise generalization error expressions and optimization speed. Uh, our proofs from L2 to L1, the jump requires new uniform convergence arguments, but once you can do L1, you can actually go to any LP geometry, our proofs directly extend to that. And we can also talk of certain other, you know, data generating models. Um, and there are many other perspectives on boosting, which I didn't touch upon today, but uh, I hope that, you know, this helps understand, the, you know, these ensemble learning methods uh, more precisely, you know, as opposed to understanding upper bounds on, you know, their performance. Uh, and, you know, this, this opens up doors to further questions uh, and uh, maybe I will just stop here. Uh, we, have a, we have a draft and archive on this work, but we are sort of revising to include several extensions at this moment. And I'll be ha happy to send that around for if someone is interested. Uh, thank you.